All right, thanks everybody. I've got another mic coming. You do. All righty, thanks very much. So yes, yeah, so first thanks very much for having me to give this talk at this August 75th anniversary. Um, is that, is, are my slides squished a bit? I'm not quite sure. I hope not. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad to also be talking after Yuri Tumre. So he was talking about the interior, and now we're using the, the surface of the sun as the boundary between our two talks. And I'll be talking about how the magnetic field sort of pokes up and out. I've got this nice uh, eclipse image here that shows how the magnetic field is stretched out by the solar wind at larger distances from the sun. But I'll get there, and I hope to talk about some of these issues at how magnetic fields are First, you know, once they emerge from the, from the dynamo in the interior, how they're jostled around by convection that still continues to exist at the sun's surface, um, how the magnetic field is twisted, braided, tangled, mangled, whatever, as, as, it's, uh, as it evolves up into the outer solar atmosphere, the hot solar corona, and then how the outflow of, of plasma from the sun, the solar wind, stretches out the magnetic field throughout the solar system. And if I have time at the end, I do hope to fit to let you know how this is happening in some other stars as well. So I have had some great introductions, so maybe I don't have to go through some of the basics here. You know, the sun's active atmosphere, you know, the last 75 years really has also uh, corresponded to a huge um, increase in our understanding about what the sun's uh, outer atmosphere is really like. You know, if all we had was visible light, we, all we would know is that the sun is a relatively spherically symmetric uh, star with occasional spots and, and smaller scale granulation that I'll talk about. Um, but of course, as we've uh, extended our telescopes up into space with you know, balloons and satellites and rockets, um, we've learned that by looking at other wavelengths, other than visible light, that there's a lot more going on. The, uh, and, and all this extra stuff that's going on is organized by the magnetic field. You know, we see these loops of, of plasma that follow the magnetic fields from one polarity to the other. Excuse me, to the other. The sunspots correspond to these bright active regions that are also strong knots of magnetic field. And, and you know, this is an EUV image from the SDO uh, spacecraft. And it turns out that when we start to look at all these things in more detail, uh, with you know, CCDs measuring the photons, uh, we, we're, we're not limited by our eyeballs, right? Because we see a huge dynamic range in the light that's coming from the active regions to the much less dense regions of the so-called quiet sun. And then even above the, above the solar limb, there are these black regions that we can use the magic of computers to enhance. And we can see, I can even maybe toggle back and forth between these. You can really see that the, the plasma that's following these magnetic field lines really does extend out as far as, as you can see. This is the edge of the field of the view of, of, of this particular telescope. And of course, we, can, we know with, with the eclipse images and coronagraphs that these things keep going uh, much further out. So we really do know that the magnetic fields and the plasmas are intimately connected with one another through a whole range of different uh, observations. But let me go back to the surface again, Oops. because the um, it's, 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 the, it's the convection that's driven by the dynamo, uh, or that, that's you know, intimately connected with the dynamo, that causes these you know, rising and falling uh, convection cells. We can see a, a close-up. This is now about a 10-year-old movie of a close-up of some of the convection. Actually, I think this sunspot is, I think, if I go back, the same sunspot that I saw here, but maybe one or two months later, if it survived. Uh, but the, we've got this, these, these convection cells, the so-called solar granules, the, the granulation motions that rise and fall stochastically, just like the bubbles in a, in a, in a boiling pot of soup, as, as Sarah mentioned. Um, and the magnetic fields thread through these uh, features and are carried along by the granulation motions. I mentioned this movie is about 10 years old. It's a little blurry. A more recent snapshot of the granulation is shown at the bottom. And if you look at the granulation in certain uh, bands of the spectrum, the, the so-called G-band in the blue-violet part of the spectrum, or in certain infrared regions, you can see these dark lanes where the bubble motions are falling back down. You can see these little bright spots, the so-called the, the so you know, intergranular bright points. That's where the magnetic field collects. The, the, 
small little knots of magnetic field are brought up by the granulation and drawn into these lanes in between where the, where the motions are colliding and the magnetic field collects there. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening on these small scales. You know, this box is only a you know, one one thousandth or so of the, of the solar radius. If we look to larger scales, the magnetic field continues to organize itself on larger scales. The so-called supergranular uh, uh, pattern of the sun. This is a, another UV image from SDO that shows the surface of the sun. You see this bright sort of spider web network that extends out from the sunspots and active regions over, th over the entire surface of the sun. These things are about 30 times bigger than the granules. And the magnetic fields slowly collect together in, again, in the lanes between the individual cells. And, and uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, in order to, to get our minds around um, what's going on, we often have to resort to these sort of cartoon type descriptions. You know, we're, we're looking at this complicated three-dimensional uh, uh, collection of magnetic fields and, and plasma. And to really understand what's going on, we have to resort to, to some simpler pictures. So for example, we have the, 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 the granular cells that I've indicated with these little hexagons here, these little knots of magnetic field in the intergranular lanes that are connected to magnetic fields that, that extend up through the solar surface. They eventually collect together on, a, on the larger scale of the lanes between the supergranules, and the field is, is stronger there. That's why it's brighter. And then on even larger scales, as you have magnetic fields of positive and negative polarity, you know, random, randomly walking around the surface of the sun, you get these larger scale loops or occasionally features that extend up uh, much further from the, from the surface of the sun. Now, this is all very interesting. Of course, one of the practical reasons that we care about the sun's magnetism is that it's related to the, the, the thermodynamics of the outer solar atmosphere, the hot solar corona. You know, it's a very practical reason. And of course, everyone at HAO is familiar with all the steps in the space weather that are involved. Um, and, and over the decades, we've really realized that the coronal heating problem is, is a magnetic problem. You know, when there's stronger magnetic fields, there's more coronal heating, not just more, not just higher temperatures, but higher densities and pressures of the plasma as well also. So there's more, there's more material being brought up into the, into the hot corona when there's a stronger magnetic field. And over to the right is just a, a, a theorist's view of, of the one-dimensional structure as a function of height of what's happening as, you, as the temperature is hanging around at a few thousand to about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And then rapidly, at some point above the surface, is, is mysteriously energized by two orders of magnitude in temperature to these million degree temperatures in the corona. So it's still a, it's still a mystery as how this happens. Um, nearly everyone agrees that the, that, that, that the, the overall <coughs> energy budget, that, the, that, that we, where the energy for the coronal heat comes from, uh, nearly everybody agrees where that, where that comes from. It's the convection, right? All this kinetic energy in these bubbling motions at the, at the photosphere has more than enough energy. In fact, all you have to do is take about 1% of that energy and somehow bring it up to the corona and transform it uh, to, to, to produce the coronal heating. So there's a chain of events. You know, it's the energy has to be transported up to the corona. It has to be temporarily stored in the magnetic field. Sarah gave some, some examples of that. And of course, we know because the heating is related to the field strength that the magnetic field has to be involved somehow. But then ultimately, all that energy has to be given back to the particles of the gas and given back in a randomized way that results in a higher temperature, or a higher entropy even. So yes, over the past 75 years or so, people have been scratching their heads over the coronal heating problem, essentially identifying the physical processes that produce the coronal heating. It's not easy. We've got some great observations, but we've also got a huge laundry list of possible uh, theoretical explanations. The theorists have gone crazy in terms of uh, proposing all these different alternatives. Um, sometimes when I give talks to, uh, to, to people who work in the, in the magnetosphere or in the Earth's atmosphere, I give these lists of, of possible you know, plasma physics mechanisms. and people who have a, have a, have a, have a more intimate uh, connection to their, to their observations, you know, local sampling of, of plasmas, they often just say, well, all these things are happening at once. 
all simultaneously. There's no one answer, but, but, the, but what we're trying to do is to pin down the, the, the relative fractions, the, the relative contributions of all the different theories. So I can just give a quick uh, summary of two sort of popular theories, and, and the, the difference between them depends on the time scale of what's, what's changing in the corona. And, and what's changing as far as the, the convective energy propagating up into the corona. If, if, the, if the motions in the, in the, in, at the surface of the sun that eventually make it up to the corona are rapid, the propagation aspect takes the form of waves. You, know, you can think of the magnetic field as, a, as you know, these magnetic field lines. You could think of them as an analogy to um, you know, taut wires, you know, gu guitar strings. You know, if you if you pluck the guitar string with a very rapid motion, that 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 transverse motion will propagate through the, the string as a wave, and you'll you'll hear the sound. Um, if you if you makes make much more slow changes to the guitar string at one end, and say it's fixed at the other end, and maybe you're surrounded, maybe the guitar string, you're, you're looking at a bundle of guitar strings and you're just changing a few of them very slowly at one end, and they're fixed at the other end, they will gradually twist and tangle and turn into a braided um, uh, distribution of strings, field lines. Again, the analogy seems to hold up. But ultimately, as you add more and more energy slowly and slowly, uh, the, the tension in these twisted and tangled uh, guitar strings will eventually snap. And this is essentially the, the magnetic reconnection that, uh, that, that, that we see in solar flares, coronal mass ejections. Uh, but for, for decades, people have looked at the, at the rapid wave idea and the slow tangling and braiding idea as sort of two different mutually exclusive possibilities. In the past 10 years or so, and I'm using these two opposite colors and then using purple in between to talk about another um, Another idea that is sort of a hybrid of the two, turbulence, magneto-hydrodynamic magneto turbulence, MHD turbulence, um, which seems to be something that takes some of the aspects of the waves and the, the slow tangling and braiding ideas and unifies them into a single picture. It seems to explain a lot of the coronal heating. The a turbulent cascade is something that, that all of you are familiar with, of course. We see turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, in the oceans, in your pot of coffee when you're stirring your coffee at a certain scale, and you see spontaneous generation of smaller eddies and smaller swirls in the coffee. Um, and we've modeled it. You know, we've, we've seen it in the laboratory. I've been modeling it with uh, increasingly sophisticated with, uh, computer simulations. And we've been observing the, the hints of it with telescopes. This is the COMP telescope, Steve Tomsick's paper from 2007. Uh, where you see red and blue Doppler shifts above the solar limb with, uh, with, with COMP. And these are, now these are believed to be the same thing that we're seeing in the simulation, the swaying motions of turbulent wave packets that are propagating along the magnetic field and undergoing this, this, this uh, cascade from large to small eddies. Of course, as you go to smaller and smaller and smaller eddies, eventually it reaches a tiny scale where the, the kinetic energy in the swirling motions dissipates as random energy, and that's the heat. That's the coronal heating process that's believed to happen. It seems to explain a lot of what we, what we actually see. So the coronal heating problem really isn't solved, but I think we've gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of traction out of trying to come up with a hybrid between these fast and slow ideas in terms of this turbulence language. So there's a lot of other uh, new observations, and, and which are giving rise to other controversies and, and, and problems that people are thinking about. So for example, the Hinode and Iris uh, uh, spacecraft have observed the solar chromosphere in a lot uh, more fine detail and with a lot of uh, more rapid time resolution. And they see the so-called spicules and jets. This is a chromospheric image, uh, upper chromospheric image from Iris. You can see the bright uh, supergranular network again as these bright features. But if you can see closely, jutting up to the, to the upwards and to the right from most of these things, you see these thin straw-like jets that are, that are uh, uh, coming up. Those seem to be following the magnetic field lines. They have rapid upward motions. Um, so there's, there's, there's currently a debate going on in the solar community about whether these little jets contribute hot gas up to the million degree gas that's overlying this cool uh, uh, chromosphere and transition region, 
Or some, some of the observations are indicating that this cool gas is coming up and then it just falls back down. But if, the, uh, if it contributes the hot gas to the corona, that's another major piece of this coronal heating problem that we need to take account of. There are other, other debates about the, uh, about the time scales of what's really going on. You know, is, the, is, the, is all of this energy, is all of this braiding of the, of the uh, guitar string really coming from just the surface? Is it really coming from the, the upper edge of the convection zone, the so-called foot point jostling idea I've been talking about? Um, that seems to be the case. The, the time scales of that seem to be of the order of a, a few minutes. The, the granular flux tubes and the jet lifetimes and a lot of the other properties of what we see seem to fall around a few minutes. However, if you go out into interplanetary space and you look at the magnetic fluctuations that are thought to be linked back down to the, to the solar surface, the dominant periods aren't a few minutes. They're hours to days. So a lot of people have been thinking about other things that have to be going on, possibly other ways of injecting turbulent energy into these open flux tubes that are, that are extending out. Magnetic reconnection is one possible idea. If it's happening on the larger scale of this magnetic uh, uh, supergranular region, the so-called magnetic carpet, uh, that could be injecting more slow uh, variations into the, into the turbulence. OK, we can keep moving out from the surface and talk about the solar wind. Here's that eclipse image again. You know, the, the solar wind is a, is a continual evaporation of particles from the, from the surface of the sun. They're accelerated out through the solar corona, and they, in turn, stretch out the, uh, the magnetic field with their, with their pressure as they, as they go out. There's some, some really neat history of the solar wind that, that, that crosses over a lot with HAO's early history, right? The, the, the 100 years or so between about 1850 and 1950 is where the evidence was slowly, slowly building uh, in, in people's minds, essentially, for the existence of this outflowing gas from the surface of the sun that extends throughout the solar system. There was a lot of cause and effect that had to be uh, worked out. You know, this Carrington event in 1859 was followed by a lot of things happening on the, uh, on the Earth, you know, bright auroras, problems with telegraph wires. You know, at, at the time, 1859, the uh, telegraphs were the, were the main source of large large uh, electrical conductors you know, threaded, you know, uh, threaded across the landscape. So if there were small changes in the, uh, in the electrical properties of the upper atmosphere, that's where you'd see it. There were a few telegraph lines that actually turned on during this, during the, uh, during this time, with, with that, and that people could communicate without running their batteries at the telegraph station. It's pretty interesting. Uh, astronomers have been looking at these comet ion tails that seem to be always pointed away from the sun, no matter the direction of the comet's motion. So something from the sun is pushing the material out. And it was in 1958 that uh, Gene Parker uh, put a lot of the pieces together. I'm a theorist, so I, so I, I, I talk about the, the, the development of the theory as the, uh, as the key event. But there was a huge amount of observational uh, work that, that, that went into this as well. Right? Gene Parker connected the pieces of the hot million degree corona with the existence of this outflowing solar wind with the idea of a gas pressure gradient. You know, same thing that's happening in a balloon that's filled with high pressured air that, that is opened up and there's a jet of air that comes out. You know, gas wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. And Parker realized that that, that was enough with a million degree corona to counteract the inward pull of gravity to generate this, this outflow. And you can see the outflow very nicely. Uh, uh, this is a, another version of this coronagraph uh, movie that, 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 that Sarah showed. Uh, this is from the LASCO instru instrument on SOHO. The, the bright solar disk has been blocked out by this uh, lollipop-shaped occulter. The solar disk is the size of the, of the white circle. And it gets a little bigger to block out some of the extra light. Uh, and you can see, you can actually see the outflow of the solar wind, also the coronal mass ejections. Uh, but you can really see the outflow of the solar wind happening nearly everywhere. The, uh, the eagle-eyed among you might be looking at the North Pole, and you can actually see some places where material is falling back down. Neil Sheely has been studying those for, for several decades. But overall, the material is escaping throughout the solar wind. And there is a, there is a solar cycle dependence to what the solar wind looked like, and a magnetic dependence. The magnetic field really organizes what the solar wind is doing. Now, there's about a factor of three variation 
in the eventual wind speed that you see in the solar system, despite there being just one you know, gravitational escape speed from the sun, the, the, the wind speed can vary over this factor of three. The fast wind seems to be connected to these dark coronal holes, these dark regions of more or less one polarity on the surface of the sun. They're at the north and south poles at solar minimum, but they're all mixed around at solar maximum. The slow speed wind seems to come from everywhere besides the coronal holes, but there's still no good agreement in the community about where, about what's, what's the real census of, of all these different magnetic structures and what types of low speed wind they, they produce. There's a lot of talk about these streamers. They're, often, they're sometimes called helmet streamers because they look like those World War I German helmets with the, with the peaks at the top. Um, they're in, in the equatorial plane at solar minimum and again distributed around in latitude at solar maximum. There's also been recent, a lot of recent thought about the so-called pseudo streamers. They're streamers and pseudo streamers and they depend on the magnetic uh, polarities. I hope you can see this cartoon. A, a regular streamer is, a, is, is essentially a magnetic loop with a positive polarity at one end and a negative polarity at the other that's stretched out into this cusp-like shaped by the solar wind. A pseudo streamer is essentially two loops that's stretched out so that, that the magnetic polarity on either side is of the same polarity. So there's, there's differences in how the magnetic flux tubes expand. There's a lot more squashing of the field lines in these uh, pseudo streamers. And it's still a very active field to try to figure out what type of solar wind is associated with all these different, differently stretched flux tubes that, that, that are rooted down in the solar corona. OK. Um, of course, there's a lot going on as you go out from the sun in the outer heliosphere. The solar wind interacts with the planets, but it's also dragged around by the sun's rotation. Parker also uh, uh, originated the study of the so-called Parker spiral, looking at how the, that how different parcels of solar wind that are connected to a certain longitude on the sun, as the sun's rotating around, looking down on the pole here, how they're connected into this sort of garden sprinkler uh, spiral structure. And eventually, as you go out to huge scales of hundreds of astronomical units, the solar wind is interacting with the interstellar galactic magnetic field. There's been studies for decades about how this looks, but it was really only in the last year or so that numerical simulations have really linked up the implications of the existence of these Parker spirals and these larger scale flows with the interstellar medium. Marav Ofer has a recent simulation of what the boundary between the solar wind and the interstellar uh, uh, magnetic field look like, and it seems to be this sort of croissant-shaped thing that's, that's, that's heavily guided by the spiraling magnetic fields close to the sun and the streaming of the interstellar magnetic field at larger scales. So this was quite surprising. If I, I was hoping to have a little more time to talk about other stars that have other types of magnetic fields, other winds, the uh, uh, people into astronomy will know the, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, right? Stars temperature or color on the x-axis and brightness, luminosity on the y-axis. There's a main sequence of stars of different masses, and the, the white lines show how the stars evolve over billions of years. Um, the points here are measurements of the, 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 the strength of the stellar wind, the amount of mass lost by the star per second, essentially, in the form of, a, of, a, of the stellar wind. The color is the, is the amount of mass loss. It goes over uh, 12 orders of magnitude in, in, in this mass loss rate. The sun is sitting down here with a dark blue, sort of puny mass loss rate. The sun would lose its own mass, one solar mass, in 10 to the 14 years, 100 trillion years, which is longer than the age of the universe. So the sun is in no danger of evaporating away as a, 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 from, its, from its solar wind. But there are some stars that would lose a solar mass's worth of material, these red and orange ones, in only about 10,000 years. And that's a blink of an eye to a, to a star. Um, so it's interesting to, you know, we've done a lot of theoretical modeling of stars that are like the sun and, and done a good job in, in terms of using what we've learned from the solar turbulence to predict the, uh, the coronal heating and the winds of these other stars. Observationally, we, we also measure activity cycles and rotation of these other stars. Um, there's been enough stars measured over, over several decades where we can see a correlation Stars that are rotating more slowly have longer cycles. Um, but there's these two tracks that we still don't quite understand. And 
And also, it, it's, it's, it's a bit puzzling that the sun, when you plot the sun on here, it falls annoyingly in between those two tracks. So is the sun a sun-like star, or is the sun an oddball? It might be more of an oddball. So we're, we're still learning about that. Um, there are many other solar systems with, with planets very close to their stars. There are these close-in, hot Jupiter-type uh, exoplanets. Uh, mostly, when we talk about the star-planet interactions, we're talking about the star doing something to the planet. In this case, the planet might be doing something back to the star. There, it's close enough that the magnetic fields are connected. There are, there are several uh, examples of bright spots measured on stars that are phased with the orbits of these close-in planets. It's still controversial. It comes and goes. Uh, you know, sometimes these things are measured you know, from year to year, and it sometimes is there, sometimes isn't there. There are people skeptical about that this thing might not be really happening, but, but, uh, but, but it's, it's another fascinating thing. And I've got to finish up. There's other stars without any convection, but they still have magnetic fields. There are stars who have uh, strong dipole magnetic fields that could be fossils from their birth, and they're rapidly rotating stars with centrifugal effects that pin the, pin the gas to, uh, to the magnetic field, like in, you know, you might generate gravity in a, in a rotating space station. There are close binaries where, you, where it's tidal forces that are generating the fields, and you don't even, you know, sometimes you, you can't even think about this star's field or this star's field. It's really the, the system as a whole. And that's really all I wanted to say. You know, with a, within an order of magnitude, the theories aren't doing too badly. Uh, in terms of predicting solar and stellar activity. That may be a downer of a conclusion, but I think it's, it's, it's accurate. Um, we've, 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 we've increased our understanding quite a bit, um, but, but we still need better observations to really help us choose between the theories. And there's been a lot of great interdisciplinary uh, collaboration between astrophysics, plasma physics, and solar physics as well, and I'll end it there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, time for one question before the break. And if you have any more questions, you just follow him around to the coffee. Anybody? No? Yes? One. Yeah, you, about the coronal heating problem, you said that uh, there's no shortage of energy. It's all about accounting from what sort of processes would be responsible for it. How does the unification of uh, the waves approach and the reconnection approach into a turbulent approach help with that? Um, it's, it's one good example of that. The, the amount of kinetic energy in, in the, the, the turbulent spectrum of, say, horizontal motions of, of the bright points at the surface is, um, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if, you tr if you translate that into a flux of energy, it's you know, a certain value, but then the amount of the flux of energy that needs to be dissipated to produce the corona is several orders of magnitude smaller than that. So it's just a matter of how that energy gets you know, diluted and propagates out, and some fraction of it gets, gets dissipated. You know, as, as the wave packets are propagating along the field, most of that wave energy escapes out into the solar system, and we see it with, with spacecraft. Um, but the, the, that flux of energy isn't the flux that heats the corona. It's only the, the flux that heats is only a small fraction of that because the waves are only gradually dissipated as they, as they go out. But it seems to be understood reasonably well. Maybe there's others who have other ideas. But I think, I think that the, the broad brush pictures are, are, are getting to be more firmly accepted. Right. Let's please thank Steve again. Thank you.